So I go everybody. Sorry I'm late. Um oh. just eating my sohor at the moment. Um Tommy. I know uh We're going to read past Fadger, it's not a problem. Let's just put the video on for now, yeah? While I eat. He had a tremendous amount of contact with merchants coming from different parts uh, of the world, passing through the Arabian Peninsula. I think he was a very intelligent man, very open-minded, and he was able to communicate with a great variety of peoples. He must have had great charisma as well. Mohammed had a way with people and with resolving their disputes. Once, when the Kaaba fell into disrepair, the clan chieftains quarreled over who would have the honor of putting the sacred black stone back where it belonged. Before violence could erupt, Muhammad proposed an equitable solution. United in the effort, the four leaders shared the weight and the honor. In gratitude, they invited Muhammad himself to replace the sacred stone. He became known as Al-Amin, the trusted one. There are all kinds of indications that he was tremendously interested in, in religious questions. This is obviously not something that an ordinary person probably was interested in in those days. He talked to uh, sages, Arab sages. He talked to Jewish and Christian sages who lived in the area. He used to go up into the rock hills around Mecca and meditate, think about things. And at some point had this extraordinary vision, which is spoken about very evocatively and elusively. In a cave above Mecca, Muhammad had an experience that would be the defining moment of his life. An angel was said to appear before him in the form of a man, instructing him to recite in the name of God, the Almighty. For Muhammad, it was an encounter as profound as it was deeply disturbing. You get a sense of what it would be like to be a normal person in society, perhaps unusual in the sense of your intensity for things like social justice and finding out what the meaning of life is, but not being uh, endowed with anything that would see, seem miraculous by your friends. And all of a sudden having this voice come to you and then come out of you as you speak it and recite it to other people. And that is the beginning of the prophetic career of Muhammad. The months to come would bring more revelations. Powerful words of a lyrical quality, more beautiful than the most exquisite Arabic poetry. Above all, Muhammad was to bear one message to his people, a simple yet radical proclamation, that there is only one God. The central tenet of Islam is the oneness, the indivisible unity of God, uh, not something that is simply, uh, that one pays lip service to, but something that is absolutely the most important concept. Divine unity is more than saying God is, there's only one God and there aren't other, other deities. It's only thinking about one thing. 
So to be thinking about possessions, to be thinking about status, to be thinking about power are all intellectual idols. The implications were staggering. One God meant one people. No more tribal divisions. To the poor and unprotected, the prospect was revolutionary. It seems to me that one of the most important things of, in his early teaching that isn't, isn't often talked about is the strong social justice message that he delivered. In Mecca of the time, there was an increasing separation between the haves and the have-nots. He insisted that it, this was not to be and that we should share the wealth. And it was this social justice message that I think that really got him a hearing among many of the folks. So coming with Islam, it was a new order, a new way of life. And it was a beautiful way of life because everybody was equal, black, white, men, women, children. So it had that type of uh, universal appeal, which I think was the reason why Islam spread so rapidly. Many were moved by Muhammad's message as he began to speak out in the community. It had the suppleness and symbolic depth of the great pre-Islamic poems that had been created by this people and that had given this people in Arabia such an extraordinary ear for verbal expression, where verbal expression was the commanding cultural force. Some people called him a poet, and there's a Quranic uh, surah basically saying, uh, Muhammad is not a poet. Poets speak through desire. Uh, this is not the voice of desire, this is the voice of God. Muhammad's following began to grow. They called themselves Muslims, for those who surrender to God. They set out to preserve the message Muhammad had brought. This was the beginning of the Quran. The Quran was revealed orally. But very soon people realized that it had to be written down in order to make sure that it wasn't corrupted and that the original message was maintained. And from a very early date, and it's, it's very unclear when that date was, because no early manuscripts of the Quran survived, people began copying it down. The Quran is a revelation of spiritual teaching of both ethical and social guidance. It was revealed and remains in Arabic. What's so extraordinary about the Quran is its naturalness, so that it can say the most powerful cosmic things with a sense of, of intimacy, so that power and tenderness come together constantly in the Quranic language. With words alone, the Quran delivers its vision to the faithful. Its imagery conjures a picture of the afterlife that resonates with all the power of traditional Bedouin poetry. Imagine yourself in the desert, surrounded by dust, by the glare of the sun. You wear cloaks to cover your body because the wind will just sear your skin right off your face. And you walk into an oasis. The temperature drops dramatically. There's a quiet there. The wind is no longer howling. Everywhere you look, you see green and color. The uh, world of water and paradise are symbolically tied to one another. And the Quran could conjure that up with just a few briefly chosen words. Yet for all the imagery of paradise in the Quran, there was no easy description of God. The mystery would remain. It's very difficult to talk about God without reifying God, reifying to make God into a thing 
or anthropomorphizing God, to make God into a projection of our own human self. And that's why Muslims don't uh, like sculpture, for example, traditionally, because they believe that there's that danger. And the Quran avoids that by constantly shifting the pronouns so we can't really reify God and get a, an image, a physical image of God. Rather than a physical image of God or of Muhammad, it is the beauty of the Quran itself that is celebrated in Islam. Islam developed in this context where pictures were not favored. The Quran, as it was revealed, was God's representation on earth. And Muslims felt from a very early time that the only just representation of God, God's word, was the Quran itself, not any picture of of, of God, certainly not, because you couldn't represent God, and certainly not a picture of Muhammad, because he wasn't divine. At certain times and places, people did make images of the Prophet Muhammad, but these are not religious images. These are not images meant to be worshipped. They're not images of a saint or of God. There are images of Muhammad as a historical figure. He's sort of given honor by having a very bright blue background or a white cloud near him. Um, but he's, he's not otherwise distinguished from the other characters in the story. At other times, people did represent the prophet, but he was always represented with a white cloth over his face to hide his face, so that there were different approaches to doing this. But in all of these, this, these are not devotional images. You're not supposed to look at them and pray towards them. You're to learn more about the history of your religion with the emphasis on history from them. As Muhammad's community grew, so did the opposition. People, of course, were skeptical and said, look, if you're a prophet, where's your miracle? Assalamu salamu alaykum. Sorry, we're late today. So I was, I played the video for a bit longer than usual. I um, hope everyone's good in the chat. Yeah, sorry, yeah, man. I'm going to pin that link now, inshallah. I've still not done that video yet. I need to do that video for the masjid. Before we're out of time. Um, <clears throat> mm -mm -mm. <sighs> Okay. Only 27 folk like Hamza. Where are the people at? Only 27 people like me. No, that's not nice. Why are 27 people like me? The effort I make for you guys, and only 27 people can be bothered to like me. If you've not liked the stream, just like the stream in it. There's 101 people watching right now. I don't know. But let, let's let's say 50 of them are, could well be enemies. Let's be honest. Um, they could well be enemies, couldn't they? We shouldn't uh, assume everybody watching is a friend. Because um, we have um, we've attracted some. Um, unscrupulous people who are we know are spying from behind their eyes you know from behind their sofas we, we get we get that we get that so um definitely some god logic fans here some sam shimon fans here we know that what happened to that guy who was banging on earlier about sinners and stuff what happened to him did he get timed out or something or did he just leave what happened? Did somebody tie me out? Did somebody defy my orders of leaving the trolls alone? Come on. Who was it? 
Who was it? Did you time him out? What was his name? I remember his name. Oh, there we go. He is my Lord Yusu. Sounds like an Arab Christian to me. No, it sounds like it sounds like an Arab Christian to me. Link to the video. Yeah, it's Islam Empire of Faith. Come on. Own up. Who blocked him? Who timed him out? <clears throat> what was on the menu? It was uh, crumpets. It was uh, another quintessential English breakfast. It was crumpets with um, laughing cow and uh, boiled eggs. Okay, so our target is what are we on now? We're on thirteen fifty-five. Oh, we're still on thirty fifty. Come on, PayPal. We're on thirteen fifty-five. Let's get this. Let's try and reach at least fifteen hundred. Inshallah. No, I'm gonna own up. Amberine, did you did you did you time out the um did you time out the enemy? Was it you? Or did he just leave because he didn't get any attention? Um, 1355, we're still 13. We need, oh, we still got a lot, long way to go. <sighs> I need to make a move on that. I don't know what you're talking about. Happens. I didn't time anyone out yet. Okay. Hey, Leith. Salaam, bro. Hope you're well. Okay. After Tabuk, chapter 80. Um, like the return from Bada, the return from the book was fraught with sadness. Another daughter of the Prophet, Umm Khultham, had died during his absence, and this time her husband had also been absent. The Prophet prayed at her grave, and he said to Uthman that if he had another unwedded daughter, he would have given him, her to him in marriage. Those of the hypocrites who had not taken part in the expedition now went to the Prophet and made their excuses, which he accepted, while reminding them that God knew their secret thoughts. But he told the three believers who had stayed behind to depart from him until God should decide their case. And he gave orders that no one should speak to them. For 50 days they lived as outcasts. But after the dawn prayer on the 50th day, the prophet announced in the mosque that God had relented to them in the words of the revelation which had just come. When the earth for all, when the earth for all its vastness was straightened for them and when their souls were straightened and they had come to think there is no refuge from God except in him, then turned he unto them that they might turn in repentance with him. Verily God, he is the ever-relenting, the merciful. The congregation rejoiced, and many of them hastened from the mosque to inform the three men of the good news. The youngest of them, Qab bin Malik, had pitched a solitary tent for himself outside the town. And he told in after years how he had heard a horse galloping towards him and a voice that shouted, Good tidings, Qab, whereupon he had thrown himself down in prostration to God, for there would be no good tidings except one. Then he went to the mosque. When I greeted the prophet, he said, His face shone with gladness. As he said to me, rejoice in the be best day that have come upon thee since thy mother bore thee. He sa I said, is this from the O messenger? Is this from the O messenger of God, or is it from God? 
Nay, it is from God, he answered. When the messenger was glad on account of good tidings, his face would have the brightness of a moon. Since his entry into Islam, Malik, the leader of the Hawazan, had not been idle. The Bani Thaqif might still pride themselves on the impregnability of Taif, but they were surrounded on all sides, far and wide, by Muslim communities, and any caravan they sent out was liable to be attacked and despoiled. They could not even send camels and sheep out to pasture without the risk they would be captured by Malik's men, who moreover let it be known that they would be put to death, any man of Thaqif who fell into their hands unless he abandoned his polytheism. After some months, they decided that they had no option but to send a delegation to the Prophet saying they would accept Islam and asking for a document which would guarantee the safety of their people and the animals in their land. The return from Tabuk had been at the beginning of Ramadan. In that same month, the delegation arrived from Taif. They were hospitably received and a tent was pitched for them not far from the mosque. It follows as a matter of course if, that if they entered Islam, their territory would be under the protection of the Islamic State. But the Prophet did not agree to some of their secondary requests. They asked him to let them keep Alat undestroyed for three years. And when he refused, they asked for two years and then one until finally they reduced to asking for a month's respite, which also met with a refusal. They then begged him not to make them destroy their idols with their own hands and to give them a dispensation, dispensation, not to say the five daily prayers. He insisted that they should pray, saying there is no good in a religion that has no canonical prayer. But he agreed to excuse them from destroying their idols with their own hands. And he ordered Mughira, Uru's nephew, to return with the delegation and destroy Alat, taking with him Abu Sufyan from Makkah to assist him. After their entry into Islam, the delegates fasted the remainder of Ramadan in Medina and then returned to Taif. Abu Sufyan joined the party in Mecca, but it was Mughira single-handed who destroyed the idol. His clan took certain measures to protect him, fearing that he might suffer the same fate as Urwa. But no one sought to avenge the goddess, despite the lamentations of a multitude of women who bewailed her loss. Two of the men who had most deplored the surrender of the city were neither citizens nor devotees of its lady. When the Prophet had marched on Mecca, Abu Amir, the father of Hanzala, and Washi, the Javanaliya, had both taken refuge in Taif, which seemed an impregnable fortress. But where they were now, where could they now take refuge? Abu Amir fled to Syria, and it was there that he died, a fugitive, lonely and homeless, thus fulfilling the curse he had unwittingly laid upon himself. Washi was still hesitating where to go when a man of Thaqif assured him that the Prophet would put no man to death who entered Islam. So he went to Medina, and going to the Prophet, he made his formal attestation. Even as he did, no one of the believers who was present recognized the slayer of Hamza and said, O Messenger of God, this is Washi. Let him be, said the Prophet, for once Islam is dearer to me than the slaying of a thousand disbelievers. Then his eyes rested on the black face in front of him. Art thou indeed Washi, he said, adding at the man's ascent. Be seated and tell me how thou slewest Hamza. When the javelin had finished, the Prophet said, Alas, take thou their face from me, let me not look upon thee again. As to the cousin of Abu Amir ibn Ubay, in the month after Tabuk, he fell seriously ill, and after a few weeks it was clear that he was dying. The traditional accounts differ as to the state of the soul in which he died, but all are unanimous that the Prophet led the funeral prayer for him and prayed beside his grave when he had been buried. According to one tradition, when the Prophet had already taken the stand for prayer, Umar went to him and protested against the bestowal of such grace upon a hypocrite. But the Prophet answered him, saying with a smile, Stand thou behind me, Umar. I have been given the choice and I have chosen. It hath been said unto me, Ask forgiveness for them, or ask it not. Thou wilt thou ask for forgiveness for them seventy times, yet God, yet will not God forgive them? I did and did I know that God would forgive him if I prayed more than 70 times? I would increase the number of my supplications. Then he led the prayer and walked beside the bier to the cemetery and stood behind his, beside his grave. Not long afterwards, the verse was revealed with reference to the hypocrites. And never pray the funeral prayer over them who dieth, nor stand beside his grave. For verily they disbelieved in God and his messenger and died in their iniquity. But according to other traditions, this verse had been already revealed as part of the revelation which came immediately after the return from Tabuk. Nor was it any longer applicable to Ibn Ubay, for the Prophet visited him in his illness and found that the imminence of death had changed him. He asked the Prophet to give him a garment of his own in which he could be shrouded and to accompany his body to the grave, which the Prophet agreed to do. Then again he spoke, saying, O Messenger of God, I hope thou wilt pray beside my beard and ask forgiveness of God for my sins. Again the Prophet assented, and after this death he did as he was promised. The dead man's son, Abdullah, was present on all these occasions. Thaqif were not the only tribe to send envoys to the Prophet Muhammad, to the Prophet. Many other envoys came to Medina from all over Arabia in this year of deputations. As the ninth year of the Hijra is called, amongst others who were from different parts of the Yemen, including letters from four Himarite princes who announced their acceptance of Islam. 
and the reputation of polytheism and its adherents. The Prophet replied cordially. He stressed the obligations of Islam, bidding them treat well his messengers whom he would send to collect the taxes incumbent upon Muslims, Christians and Jews, specimen that a Jew or a Christian who keepeth his religion shall not be turned away from it, but shall pay the poll tax and shall have the protection of God and his messenger. A recent revelation have been said with regard to religious differences. For each we have appointed a law and a path, and if God had wished, he could have made you one people. So try one with one another in good works. Until God, you will all be brought back, and he will then inform you of those things where you differed. Not all the deputations were conclusive. Amr ibn Tufail, the man responsible for the massacre at Bir Ma'una, was now chief of the Bani Amir, and under pressure from his tribe, he came to Medina. But he himself was an arrogant man. And in return for his Islam, he asked the Prophet to name his, him as his successor. It is not for thee to know thy people, said the Prophet. Then give me the tent dwellers and keep thou the villagers, said Ami. Not so, said the Prophet. But into thy hand will I put the reins of the cavalry, for thou art excellent horsemen. This was not enough for the Bedouin chief. Am I, have, am I to have naught, he said, disdainly, adding as he turned away. I will fill all the land with horsemen and footmen against thee. When he had gone, the Prophet prayed, O God. Guide the Bani Amir and rid Islam of Amir, the son of Tufail. And Amir was smitten with an abscess and died before he reached home. His tribe sent another deputation and a pact was at last concluded. The poet Labid was one of the envoys and he now entered Islam. He is reported to have gone and had some intentions of abjuring, of abjuring poetry thereafter. In exchange, God have given me the Quran, he said. But he had got, nonetheless continued to compose poems until his death, placing his gifts at the mercy of mercy. Placing his gift at the service of the religion, his religion. The time of the pilgrimage was approaching and the Prophet appointed Abu Bakr to take charge of it. He set off from Medina with 300 men, but not long after they had gone there came a revelation which was important that all pilgrims to Makkah, both Muslims and polytheists, should hear. None shall be a transmitter from me, but a man of the people of my house, said the Prophet. And he told Ali to set out with all speed and overtake the pilgrims. He was to recite the revealed verses in the Valley of Mina, and he was to make it clear that no one after the, this that year would be allowed to go round the Holy House naked, and that idolaters were making the pilgrimage for the last time. When Ali overtook the others, Abu Bakr asked him if he had come to command the expedition, but he replied that he was under his command. So they went together, and Abu Bakr led the prayers and preached the sermons. On the day of the feast, when all the pilgrims were assembled in the Valley of Mina to sacrifice their animals, Ali proclaimed the divine message. The gist of it was that idolaters were given four months respite to come and go as they pleased in safety. But after that, God and his messenger would be free from any obligations towards them. War was declared upon them and they were to be slain or taken captive wherever they were found. Two exceptions were made as regards those idolaters who had a special treaty with the prophet and had kept it faithfully. The treaty was to be held as valid until its term ran out. And if any individual idolater sought protection, he was to be granted and convened to a place of safety. Having first been instructed in Islam, there was also a revealed verse which seemed to be addressed especially to the recent converts of Mecca, who might fear that the exclusion of idolaters would not only deprive them of opportunities for trade, but also of many rich gifts. O ye who believe the idolaters are unclean, therefore let them not come nigh into the inviolable mosque after this their year. And if ye fear poverty, poverty, God will enrich you of his bounty. Verily, God is all-knowing, infinitely wise. The Prophet remained at home for nearly the whole of the following year, which was the 10th since his emigration. Ibrahim could already walk and was beginning to talk. Hassan and Hussein had now a small sister named after her aunt Zainab, and Fatima was expecting a fourth child. Other intimates of the households were the three sons of Jaffa. They were now the stepsons of Abu Bakr, who had married their mother Asma, and she also was expecting a child. Particularly dear to the Prophet was her sister Umm al-Fadl. In Makkah, it had been his custom to visit her often, and since Abbas moved to Medina, he was more... See, once more a frequent visitor at their house. The eldest son, after whom she was named, had now grown to manhood and received many signs of favor. On at least one occasion, when it was Maimuna's turn to house the prophet, she invited her nephew Fadl to stay with her. Deputations still continued to come in the previous year, and one of those was from the Christians of Najran, who had sought to make a pact with the prophet. They were of the Byzantine rite and in the past had received rich subsidies from Constantinople. The delegates, 60 in number, were received by the prophet in the mosque. And when the time for their prayer came, he allowed them to pray in there, which they did facing towards the east. At the audiences which they had with him during their stay, many points of doctrine were touched on. And there were some disagreements between him and them concerning the person of Jesus. Then came the revelations. Verily, the likeness of Jesus with God is as the likeness of Adam. He created him of dust and then said to him, be and he was. This is the truth from thy Lord. 
So be not of the doubters, and whose contentious with thee about him after his knowledge has reached thee, say, Come ye, and let us summon our sons and your sons, and our women and your women, and ourselves and yourselves. Then we'll appreciate putting God's curse on those who lie. The prophet's recitation, sorry, the prophet recited the revelation to the Christians and invited them to meet with him and his family to settle their dispute in the way he suggested. They said they would think about it. And the next day when they came to the prophet, they saw that Ali was with him and behind him were Fatima and her two sons. The prophet was wearing a large cloak and now he spread it wide enough to enfold them all in it, including himself for this reason. The five of them are revealingly known as the people of the cloak. As to the Christians, they said they were not prepared to carry their disagreement so far as appreciation. And the prophet made with them a favorable treaty, according to which, in return for the payment of taxes, they would have the full protection of the Islamic State for themselves and their churches and other possessions. The untroubled happiness of the early months of the year came to an end with the illness of Ibrahim. It was soon clear that he would not survive. He was tended by his mother and her sister, Serene. The prophet visited him continually and was with him when he was dying. As the child breathed his last, he took him in his arms and tears flowed from his eyes. His forbidding of vociferous lamentation had made prevalent the notion that all expressions of woe at bereavement were to be discouraged, and the mistaken idea still lingered on in many minds. O messenger of God, said Abdurrahman bin Ibn Auf, who was at present, this is what thou hast forbidden. When the Muslims see thee weeping, they too will weep. The prophet continued to weep, and when he could find his voice, he said, not this do I forbid. These are the promptings of tenderness and mercy, and that is not merciful unto him, shall no mercy he be shown. O Ibrahim, if it were not that the promise of reunion is sure, and that this is a path which all must tread, and that the last of us shall overtake the first, verily we should grieve for thee with a yet greater sorrow. Yet are we stricken indeed with sorrow for thee, O Ibrahim, that I weepeth and the hearts grieveth, nor say we aught that would offend the Lord. He spoke words of comfort now to Maria and Serene, assuring them that Ibrahim was in paradise. And having left them for a brief while, he returned with Abbas and Fadl. The young man washed the, his, washed the body and laid it out, while the two older men sat and watched him. Then it was borne from forth to the, cer to the cer cemetery on its little bier. The prophet led the funeral prayer and prayed again his son at the edge of the grave, after Osama and Fadl had laid it in, in the body. When the earth had been heaped over it, he still lingered at the graveside, calling for a skin of water. He bade them sprinkle it over the grave. Some unevenness had been left in the earth, and noticing this, he said, When one of you doth aught, let him do it to perfection. And smoothing it over with his hand, he said of his own particular action, No harm it doth no good, but it grieveth relief until it giveth relief until the soul of the afflicted. He had already stressed more than one need more than once the need to make perfection, one's aim in every earthly act. And many of his sayings indicate that this aim must be unworldly and detached. Ali is said to have summed up the prophet's guidance in this respect as follows. Do for this do for this world as if to live forever and for the next as if to die upon the morrow. To be always ready to depart is to be detached. Be in this world as a stranger or as a passerby, the prophet said. On the day of Ibrahim's death, not long after his burial, there was an eclipse of the sun. When some of the people attributed it to the prophet's bereavement, he says the sun and the moon are two signs of the signs of God. Their light is not dimmed for any man's death. If you see them eclipse, you should pray until they be clear. MashaAllah. So sad. Okay. <coughs> um, how are we doing with the... MashaAllah. We've raised... Uh, 130 pound Allahu Akbar so we're now on 14.65 so another 35 quid let's see at the 15 the 1500 pound mark inshallah oh that was so sad about Ibrahim but this was the touching on the the point where you know if he if he was a a fake prophet if he was a charlatan I mean no we could we've got to the stage we are if he was but let's just you know the accusations of that Probably that other geezer who nobody timed out. Uh, <laughs> um, he, he would have, uh, when that eclipse occurred, he would have used it, and the people were believing it was because of his son dying. They would, uh, he would have used that as a, yeah, you see, you see, I, I am the Messiah kind of thing. But, um, but he didn't. He distanced himself from that, which is not the actions of somebody who's trying to trick the people or fool the people or to convince the people that he is something that he's not. So, um, alhamdulillah, that was just that particular portion. Um, <laughs> again, again, we have to keep reiterating um, the reliability of some of the some of the details of the stories are not necessarily one hundred percent accurate. 
Okay, so we're reading this to um, we're getting the gist, we're getting an idea, we're getting a picture. But the de definitive, um, but the definitive detail, it's not always necessarily on point. We have to keep reiterating that. Okie dokie. What's going on? What's going on in the chat? Oh, it's 5.13. We'll do another 15 minutes, yeah? Then I'm going to scowl. We'll put the link out anyway. We've got 15 minutes. Where's all the where's all the God Logic fans on that? Where's all the um Where's 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 all the and anti fans? I miss I miss them. I miss them. I, I, I like I like them. I like them making the I like them bleating in the chat. Do you know what I mean? But, but let's just show the disingenuous nature of our man good logic anyway while we're here because i mean I, I was watching this again and his body language in this particular thing i'm going to show you is absolutely terrible absolutely terrible Just watch his body language. It says in that verse that it is a detailed explanation of everything. So it cannot be both. That's a contradiction. No, it can. The, the verse that Hamza mentioned does not contradict this verse. Where he said there's basically there's clear verses which are known by everyone. This is the first level of understanding, which is the layman level. Everyone can read the Quran and take something from it. There's a second level of understanding, which is known by the scholars with the derived understanding from other verses and other hadith that have been mentioned they collect it all together and understand the quran in a much deeper way and then there's the third level which is that only allah knows so just because we don't know the explanation doesn't mean it's not an explanation does it the quran says in that verse that it is why why is he why, why is he exercising <laughs> why is he exercising why is he doing all this business? Bloody hell, focus, man. And this is this is this is a, a evidence of the insincerity. Do you know what I'm saying? If if you if you're gonna ask a question, uh, at least have the decency to listen to the answer. Not just like you don't care what the answer is, you just want to keep putting it out there and exercise. It's just terrible, just terrible, terrible body language and it, it was it was so disrespectful it was unreal really really was holy spirit felt uncomfortable yeah there was someone going on should we watch it again let's watch it again is a detailed explanation of everything so Allah, the quran says in that verse that it is a detailed explanation of everything so it cannot be both. That's a contradiction. No, it can. The, the verse that Hamza mentioned does not contradict this verse, where he said there's basically there's clear verses which are known by everyone. This is the first level of understanding, which is the layman level. Everyone can read the Quran and take something from it. There's a second level of understanding, which is known by the scholars with the derived understanding from other verses and other hadith that have been mentioned they collect it all together and understand the quran in a much deeper way and then there's the third level which is that only allah knows so just because we don't know the explanation doesn't mean it's not an explanation does it the quran says in that verse that it is a detailed <laughs> What, what what was that about? I mean, John answered it. John answered it. Uh, the third level got to him. I don't know why it was. <laughs> but John answered him beautifully. You know, and, and going back to that, that particular thing, you know, the Quran's clear when it speaks about what it speaks about. 
So, mashallah, in, in the Quran, Allah says about the actual text, about the actual verses, <laughs> about the actual verses, that in this Quran, some of the, some of the ayats are clear, for, and then some are uh, ambiguous, that need understanding, yeah? So you need other verses to interpret them, basically, yeah? Or you need the teachings of the Prophet to interpret them yeah so that that's a clear explicit um verse of the quran explicit i think it's in surah al-imran maybe um where it says um explicitly that these verses these verses these verses some are clear some are ambiguous okay and then we have an ambiguous verse at the end of surah al-yusuf where it talks about um how Allah says this is a detailed explanation of everything, but you could see the context uh, based upon the context of what Allah said earlier about the ambiguous verses. We can see that well, it can't be saying that this is saying that every verse of the Quran is uh, explained because Allah has already told us that's not the case. So what else could it mean? Then we can see that it's referring to the chapter that we've just read in Surah Al Yusuf, talking about the prophets, life after death, and all of these things, which is clear. But Christians have a huge problem in distinguishing what an explicit verse is and what an ambiguous verse is. Because when the Christians read their own Bible, they do exactly the same thing. When they state there's something explicit, they ignore it. Something ambiguous, they make it explicit to suit their narrative. Anyway. There's another one where he says thanks, man, talking to the chat while you are answering him. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that that was this one, wasn't it? This one. Again. Like when he says I love you too, man, he's not talking to me. I really don't think he is. Let's let's see. This is this is we like this one. Quran, like for example, Jesus mentioned Muhammad. And I check what Jesus says, and I don't find that. I can see that the Quran made a false claim. Hey, one second. Are you saying where the Quran, where the Quran says that uh, Jesus spoke of Muhammad? You're saying to me that's false. I don't. There, there's no evidence anywhere. A few moments later. Je just have to say this. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, oh, I suppose really? that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. What does that mean? I love you too, man. But what does that mean? What does uh, that mean? It, it, it means there were other things that he said and did that were not recorded. Oh, oh so by he could have said by, things by, that are not recorded. Yeah, I, 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 this is this is the thing, and then you you see his um, background with him sat on this chair and all that. Um, you can see that he's been prom prompted, prompted up. And again, you know, I, I hate repeating myself, but um, I feel like I have to. Yeah, I agree. Okay, just a quick one. Right. I did a video yesterday about likening the Christians to Speaker's Corner to mental patients on a day out. Okay. You supporters of these guys are not helping them. Yeah, you're encouraging the mental illness. You're, you're, you're saying, well done, you, you won the debate, well done, Hamza was smoked. The problem you've got is, you don't even understand the argument being presented. You don't even, that means you don't even recognize how miserable the, per, the Christian I'm talking to failed. All you saw was a Christian ranting, uh, producing rhetoric, and because they're a Christian, you blindly applaud it and think they did something. You're encouraging their mental illness, and it needs to stop. Oh, we haven't done this for a while. It's a mental in Speaker's Corner. Mental? Have you seen mental? Men I swear, it's like the local mental hospital had a day has a day trip every Sunday, and the coach piles up, and Hatun gets on it, and Acid gets on it, and Captain Bloodfire gets on it, and K gets on it, and Soko gets on it, and you are they all and they bring it to to Hyde Park, and they all pile off. They spend the day at Speaker's Corner, go for a meal later, 
and then it's back to the hospital because they're all mental. It's been a while. I don't recognize myself. I don't even recognize myself without hair anymore. Honestly, when I see a video without hair, I'm thinking, who's that guy? <coughs> oh, oh, Asif is still there. Asif is still there. And, and, and undoubtedly, uh, Asif is still there. It's so normal to see you with hair now. I know, it just seems weird when <laughs> without, without hair. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, it feels weird. It really, really does. Uh, the vid never gets old, but needs new faces. Yeah, it's true. Well, we'll see you. We'll see you when I go to the park next time. Uh, Lactose is here, but I think Lactose, you're a young boy, aren't you? How old are you, Lactose? I'm sure you said you were young. Uh, and... Yeah, I'm 13. Yeah, go on. What, what brings you on here, mate? Yeah, I like. I just, I just been interested about like the uh, the solar eclipse on Ramadan. I just wanted to know your explanation for it because some Muslims say that it's gonna like Imam Mahdi is gonna come. Or like it's a sign of Piyama and stuff like that. And some Christians say that like uh, so-called Jesus is going to come back on that day. But I just want a new explanation for that because I mean, you're, I know you're a wise man, and I feel like you're going to good, 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 give a good explanation to it. Um, no, I have no idea uh, with regards to the significance of a solar eclipse in Ramadan. Okay, then I guess. Um, Unless there's an authentic narration by the Prophet Sallallahu telling that um, one of the signs of uh, Qiyamah or Mehdi is uh, a solar eclipse in Ramadan, but uh, I'm not aware of it. There may be, I don't know, but no, it's not something I'm aware of. All right. Uh, th thank you. You're welcome, your man. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. All right. Assalamu There may well be something, I don't know. I'm not I'm not really That's no, not Sheldon. Mashallah, lactose is a Muslim, mashallah. He's only thirteen. SubhanAllah. But it's mashallah, it's a nice that uh, a thirteen year old is uh, paying attention to his religion, mashallah wanting to know more about his religion, not just playing with his power rangers. So it's it's really cool. Do you know what I mean? So alhamdulillah. I mean it's amazing, um, and I'm still trying to work it out. I'm still trying to work it out. Why kids love Hamza's Den? Yeah, I, I'm still trying to understand it. Why um, a lot of children they enjoy Hamza's Den? You know, when they come in the shop and the, the parents tell me, oh, they love watching your channel and stuff. It's really, really nice. Just for a second. Uh, did they start making Power Rangers? No, I'm sure, sure they still do, don't they? I don't know. What did it, it was when I was I used to sell toys in it uh, back in the day. Power Rangers, WWE, and um, Star Wars was the order of the day for the kids 
and my perpetually I'm, I'm assuming kids are still into that but i don't know what they're into these days probably still must still be into star wars and all that because you're a cool river uncle who plays video games and stuff that could well be true rose with thorns that that could could well be true But it's amazing, how, how, you know, how young boys and girls, because your kids like your base on Daisy. <laughs> they haven't seen my base on Daisy and, and all the fences. I'll show you all my fences. Although we got raided. Uh, when did we get raided? I got raided last night, actually, my base, but it was someone cheating. So I got all my stuff back. They're into switches and iPads. Oh, they don't play with the Power Rangers and stuff anymore. <laughs> when am I gaming it again? Um, again? Uh, you mean you mean live streaming gaming? It will be after Ramadan, because I don't want to uh, distract people from the ibadah, and because people all over the world are doing ibadah at different times of the day based upon where they are in the world, my gaming might interrupt their ibadah and might distract them from their ibadah. So I said, I'm not going to live stream any gaming during Ramadan. But after Ramadan, inshallah, we'll pick up the pace. We'll continue with our banishers and we'll do some daisy lives. Um, hopefully, MA is going to join us um, on daisy. Um, I think Red was going to join us as well. Hopefully, Carter is going to join us as well um so we'll we'll get some daisy adventures going after ramadan but in ramadan i don't want to distract people from the ibadah see i know when i do a little bit of gaming here and there i know that it's not interrupting ibadah for me but if i don't know who is doing what in the world so i just thought in ramadan i'll just keep the lives to these ramadan uh to these ramadan lives reading from the seerah having a little bit of a chat afterwards um alhamdulillah hamza was there a time when you played fifa yeah 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 i, I play fifa you want to join the game truthful one when you say you want to join the game you want to actually join us on day z I can't remember how to play banishers. Oh God, I hate I hate stopping playing a game because um, uh, I'm going to pick it up and then be like, oh, but what does this button do? <laughs> I hate it honestly. I forget I forget all the moves or all, all, all the things that, be, that have become like second nature while you've been doing it. Um, I forget it all. Uh, Daisy is played on um, PC. We play. What time is it here? Time here is five thirty-two a.m. We got raided yesterday. I was not happy. No, yesterday. Day before. Day before. But someone cheated, man. It glitched into my base. No more reading. Uh, no, no, no. We, we finished reading for today. We, we've got... Um, we've not got long to go now. Uh, I support Man United. Never played before. Yeah, if you haven't played it before, unfortunately, uh, you're not going to get past any scrutiny because we need people, uh, other than the people that have already been agreed to join us, uh, we need people who know what they're doing because... Things are about things are getting a little bit serious now, raiding and all this kind of stuff. 
But maybe, maybe the next game we play um, community-wise, you can join. But I'm pretty sure you're going to struggle to get past Enyan and his uh, recruitment. Thank you, Suleiman Shaban. Let's see how we're doing on the GoFundMe. Bismillah. Come on, 1485. We just need another 15 pound. Let, let's finish on 1500. Just need another 15 quid. Laith does dow it in game. Laith, mashallah, he's been. Laith, jump on, man. Tell the people what you've been doing in Daisy. It's so cool. Um, here's the link, bro. Just just explain to the people what you've been doing in Daisy, where someone said that um, you should do Dow in game. <coughs> I think it's pretty cool, man. I think it's a pretty cool um, idea. Oh, thank you for the support of the gentleman. Come on, Leith. Tell the people what you've been doing. I don't want to steal your thunder. I want you to let the people know what you've been doing in Daisy. Um... I don't know what Leith's doing. I don't know what time it is where Leith is. Um, you going to jump on, man? Come tell the people. Are you shy? You're not shy. What's a midget? A midget is like a like a dwarf, like a very small person. I mean, I don't know if he is or not. Okay, we don't need to start insulting him now. We don't win arguments by insulting people. Come on, Leith, what are you doing? Or maybe Leith's not actually in the stream. He's just coming on saying salams here and there. Knowing Leith, it's proper dawa and not an elaborate ruse to get them to donate nails. <laughs> here he is. Assalamu alaikum, Leith. Oh, yeah, sorry. We had to uh, let him go do his hair in that first point. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. How are you doing? Uh, Alhamdulillah, good bro. Good bro. So yeah, usually what I do uh, when I'm gaming and I uh, meet a gentleman uh, or a lady that is kind, and uh, I usually start with the line, have you heard of Speaker's Corner? It's classic. Most people say no. And then you just say, oh, yeah, I'd love to introduce you. And what I usually say is, it's a place that's over 100 years old where people from all different walks of life, backgrounds and belief systems, there's my cat, will, <laughs> will uh, come to discuss and debate. And sometimes, uh, sometimes they just flat out say, no, that's not my vibe, and I don't push it. I say, okay, no worries. Um, but if they're interested, I usually just drop the Hamza's Den channel, EF Dawa. Um, and alhamdulillah, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a good way to, uh, <laughs> to uh, give some Dawa without really trying too hard you know it's not difficult to ask them if they've heard of a place and then to just you know. alhamdulillah well you've, no but i'm i'm talking more about the notes what you've been doing with the notes oh the notes oh subhanallah yeah so you can actually write notes in daisy and uh i'll uh leave like if somebody uh, kills me in game they'll find a note on my body giving them dawah <laughs> <laughs> or I'll just put them up on the walls in different places for people to run into. They go, hey, what's this? And uh, subhanAllah. But, what, was it, what, wasn't you putting verses of the Quran and things up? What, what, oh, right? yeah, some hadith and, and Quran. Yep, for sure. Yeah, because in the game, you can write notes and you can put them on walls and things, isn't it? Exactly, yep. And, and Laith has been hoarding pens and writing notes. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 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 We got raided, you know that? Did my base get touched? I wanted I wanted to ask, but I didn't want to seem like I was worried about my stuff more than that. <laughs> you mean you mean the one that was on the on the right hand side where yeah. there's no door on it? To be honest with you, right? I don't know how they got into the courtyard. Yeah. Well, we know how they got in the courtyard. To be honest with you, because they pulled the truck out and they climbed on the truck and jumped over. Yeah. How they got to get to the truck, we don't work. We can't work that out. Yeah. But they they hit Klotz's base again. 
<laughs> this time they went through the the other end. And you, yours is open. If they'd have gone through the open door, your base is just open. Both doors yeah. are open. Yeah. Um, but we we can't work out how they got in the courtyard. Mm, and uh, they didn't just get in the courtyard. They got into the courtyard. They got into the place where the Humvee was. And they took the camo net off. And they got next to my base to steal the mm. uh, canopy tent. So we think there's there's some dodginess going on. But, um, Probably. I mean, if the admin is compensating you, then definitely. <laughs> Oh, no, no, that was someone else. That was someone else. Someone oh, glitched into my base through a window, oh. putting like a storage locker down, and then they like, glitched through the window. Um, but So the admin banned all their clan and uh, returned all my good stuff. You know what that means, though, Hamza? It means our base is so uh, <laughs> so fortified that people have to glitch to get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't know how they, we don't know how they, they got into the other side. We, okay, we can't work it out. I was looking at all the – I was going around with the admin – trying to find a weak point and i couldn't find any it was like, how did they get in and how did they get there and get there and get there exactly subhanallah anyway subhanallah. appreciate right. you bro thank you for the the uh, reading jazakallah khairan man for all the work you do man but right. our oh, last question have you got any nails no oh, come <laughs> i haven't on. played in a while not nah, it's the last come 10 on. days bro yeah i've been a little bit uh oh lazy subhanallah <laughs> yeah you need to, you need to check in because people are taking advantage of us because a lot of people have not been playing in the last 10 days and we're getting mm. raids and we're getting this and we're getting that so you just need to just if you get a chance just pop in just see what the score is all inshallah, right inshallah have all right salam alaikum take care man Allah. top lad yeah we think someone's been hacking we just can't work it out how, how the, there are hacks but the good thing is is admins as well and admins can uh, so what the admin did they found the guy who did it um and they banned him until he gives evidence that he didn't hack because the admins like um <laughs> the, the admins like I, I i can't work out how they've done what they've done either it doesn't seem possible to have got into this area this area and this area without blowing the doors but they seem to have been in all three areas, but there doesn't seem a way that you could be and get into all three areas, the way you've got everything walled off. So the admin's like, it, oh, it looks like cheating. He goes, I can't work it out because there's no way they could possibly do this. It doesn't seem. So he's actually banned the guy and said to the guy, look, you need to demonstrate that you didn't cheat. Because when you raid, you should uh, record it so you can provide evidence that the way you got into the base wasn't an illegal way. It wasn't a hack. It was legit. And the, the admin might come back to me and said, uh, well, he sent me evidence of how he got in and it, it was legit. And then we're going to be like, what? <laughs> There's a legitimate way to get into our base. And then I'm going to be running around with my hammer and nails and my wood trying to work out where I need to build a fence. <laughs> Any excuse to build a fence. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that was the situation. But um yeah, 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 yeah. I made a ticket. The admin, the admin was with me. We, he, he teleported into my base and he was walking around with me and I was showing him that there's no way they could get here and get here and get here. There's just no way. If the doors were blown, yes, of course. You could jump one fence at one point, maybe, but you couldn't get into the other three areas. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you, you couldn't get into the other three areas. It's, it's just not possible. So the admin was so convinced of the security of my base that he uh he actually banned the other guy and said look give him two days to respond to see whether or not he did it uh legit or not he seems to be a regular player seems to have a good base himself seems strange to to risk all his hard work for just a glitch glitching into a base so uh he's given two days to uh come back to him and if he doesn't come back to him then he's gonna class it as it was a hack and he's gonna compensate the brother who lost all his gear with the gear he lost so Anyway, that's uh, Daisy. No, the admins know. The admins, so if someone comes in, if someone bl uh, blows something up, takes something, erects something in your area, the, uh, the admin will have a log of who did that. So the admin knows exactly who it was who um, blew a gate, put up a tent, took down something. The admin took the camel off our cars. The admin knows exactly who it was. So that's why he knew exactly who to ban. He knew exactly who glitched into my base and he banned their whole clan. So, um, yeah, yeah, they, they, they have logs and things. That's a good thing about playing with uh, on community servers with admins because you have some, if someone cheats, you've got someone you can click cry to. If it, you're playing on official, forget it. There's no one to complain to. 
And that's why a lot of people don't play on official servers because there's so many hackers. I think the guys who glitched into my base were Russians. Um, and, uh, you know, the Russians and the Chinese are usually the worst for the hacking. Yeah. Sorry, Rose. <coughs> In case anyone wonder what's going on, we're talking about Daisy and the gaming channel. Come on, 1485. Let's get another 15 quid so I can go. So raising, so just to remind you what the what we're trying to raise funds for. Um, let me just um, one second. So this is what we're raising the funds for. So this is the Ramadan appeal, and uh, this is what it is. Um, Salaam alaikum brothers and sisters, this fundraiser is trying to raise £10,000 to go towards the cost of building the wudu area at my local masjid, where all of my dawah began, and from where Hamza's den could have a base in the future once the project of building the masjid is complete. Here are a few words from the Imam Foundation Management. Salaam brothers and sisters, I pray this message reaches you in good health, and Iman, this Ramadan is a blessed one. The management would like to thank you once again for your beautiful support, and may you continue to do so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never stops, and it can work never stops and can only continue with the support of your beautiful heart and souls once again we appeal to you to help raise funds for a beautiful cause we're working on the wudu area which is a beautiful reward this is a lifetime opportunity every drop of water used will be a reward in this world and the next you can also do sadaqah for your lost loved ones and give them another opportunity for a beautiful reward we humbly request you to all unite and help the cause help the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month of ramadan Iman Foundation Management. So this is what we're raising the funds for, inshallah. Um, we're on 1485 of a £10,000 target. Inshallah, once I do the video and I put the video up about it and I share it on Twitter and other places, inshallah, um, we should reach it. And, you know, and as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, whoever builds a masjid seeking the pleasure of Allah, Allah should build him a house for him in paradise. Alhamdulillah. So that's what we're raising the funds for. So, and I've said now, for example, we needed 10,000 people. Sorry, we needed 1,000 people to donate a tenner. Um, now, mashallah, we only need 865. No. Bloody hell. One second. <laughs> 800 and... 1500 and then it'd be 8500 in it uh, so yeah so we just need 835 people to donate a tenner inshallah to hit, hit our cause and i'll do i keep refreshing it and until we reach that so let's try and at least reach that i should do a live stream like this to be honest with you um so we can um I dedicate a live stream to this so we can just have a one big blast inshallah um, yeah, so donating for the masjid, of course, you can pay from zakat. Alhamdulillah. So if you have zakat to pay, this is an opportunity. You can uh, pay it there. Obviously, sadaqa is better because uh, zakat you have to give away, whereas sadaqa is something you voluntarily give away, inshallah. So, um, but yeah, mashallah, it can come from your zakat. Alhamdulillah. So like I said, we're trying to reach a £10,000 target. I think we'll do it. We did fifteen thousand. Uh, we did fifteen thousand last year, mashallah. Yeah, the no, sadaqah is voluntary. Voluntary. I won't say optional. I say voluntary. You don't have to give sadaqah, but you can give sadaqah to benefit yourself. So if you want the rewards yourself, mashallah. Imagine having the rewards of everyone doing wudu because of your your contributions, mashallah. Um, in the grave and the hasana just keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming. But I've, I, and I'm gonna. I think this one is more powerful though. Imagine your mother, your father, your brother, your sister uh, passed away. Yeah. And they're in their graves. And mashallah, you say, I'm going to donate this money on behalf of my father, of my mother, of my brother, of my sister, or such, or my husband, or my wife, or whoever's passed away. And subhanallah, they'll be in their grave and they'll start getting rewards. And subhanallah, they'll be asking, where is this coming from? And they'll be told such and such a person has done such and such a thing for you. 
So this is why one of the beautiful things in Islam is to have pious children who can act on behalf of you when you've passed. So mashallah, if you have a child and you teach that child how to pray and such, you'll be rewarded for this thing. And it's the same, mashallah, if um, you know, you've passed away and, and you're in your grave and your child is sending forth sadaqah in your name. Or well, not necessarily even your child, but somebody sending sadaqah in your name. Masha'Allah, you're getting sadaqah jariah from a place that you never even dreamed of. And who knows? Who knows what that, that, that kind of hasanat will do for you, for that person in their grave? Will it ease the comfort of the grave? Will that be the thing that takes them to paradise? Subhanallah, who knows what it will do? So this is the, this is the uh, beautiful opportunity. And, and like I say, to, to, for the, the wudu area is one of the most blessed things, one of the most blessed things to donate for. Because you know that the only reason people are using that wudu area is so they can make supplication and pray to Allah. You know that's their intention, subhanAllah. So, like I say, this is a beautiful, beautiful opportunity to get in. And especially my center. It's not just your local run-of-the-mill masjid. This is a center. This is a place uh, going to be a place of learning. This is going to be a place where potentially I'll be based um, if I'm still in this area. Uh, this is uh, a dawah center. This is a place which has a whole facility floor just for the sisters. Just for the sisters, subhanAllah, it has a whole area. And I need, I need to kind of show that because uh, I keep saying it, but I don't think you appreciate it. Because in the month of Ramadan, the sisters have completely packed out their floor. And the sisters come from, I don't know where the sisters come from, but mashallah is, um, the, the, they're flocked there. And they come, and you can see that the families come in and the, the, the wives and the sisters and, and the daughters all going upstairs and the brothers coming to pray. And it's a real family place, alhamdulillah. And this is what the masjid is. The masjid is more than a place to pray, though. The masjid is supposed to be the community center. It's supposed to be the hub of the community. Do you understand? It's, it's not just a place of prayer. It's, it's supposed to be everything for the Muslim, alhamdulillah. And so that's what our center will be. It's been a long time in growing. It's, it's nearly 10 years now in building it. We're finally in the final stages, mashallah, that we've actually got round now to the wudu area and the internal part of the mosque. The out exterior has been done. Um, so inshallah, this is a cause. Get on it, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. And after all that, still didn't get 15 quid. <laughs> Come on, man. That was an inspirational talk. Subhanallah, that was inspirational. So if you've not yet donated, get in. And like I said, it's just it's just one thousand people giving tenor. That that's all. I mean, the cost of the wudu area is like I think a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand to completely do it. Because remember, we've got three floors. But that, Subhanallah, <laughs> if that doesn't inspire you to donate a tenor, I think five is the minimum then nothing, nothing will. SubhanAllah. Honestly, SubhanAllah. Right, it's 5.51, so I'm going to go very, very soon. But I, I don't want to go until that says 15. I really, really don't. So if you haven't donated it yet, you need to... You need to to do it for yourself or to do it for your loved ones or do it for somebody. We just need three people to give a fiver. That's it. Yeah, Rose with Thorns, that's what the message should be. It should be a place of um, community. Believe in Allah and his messenger and spend out of that which he has made you successive inheritors. For those who have believed among you and spent there will be a great reward. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, Amarine, I know it's Fajr time, but I'm not going till this is says 15. Just need 15 pound. That's it. And we can um, end the stream. Otherwise, we're just going to sit here in silence. 
How much in US dollars? Uh, 15 quid. Uh, in US dollars? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, 18.87 US dollars. Is that it? Eight, 15 pound is 18.87. What's the exchange rate these days? I thought it was more than that. It's saying the exchange rate is about 18, but. What's the Muslim breaking point that if a Muslim broke in the West, then he should pay zakat? You pay you pay um, zakat on savings and uh, on your excess wealth, I believe, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I asked Mr. Google as well, $18.87. But I think GoFundMe do take a, a small amount. No, I don't think you I don't think you pay like an income. I don't think so. It's I think it's excess wealth, if I'm not wrong. MashaAllah. But you gave it to Go for the oh, does it give you the option option? Yeah, I think I need to do this video. I think I think I need to show it. Um and I think maybe I think maybe you guys have donated already. So maybe I'm flogging the dead horse with you guys. I need to get it out further. Um so inshallah, I, I think the video is important. So I, sh I shouldn't I shouldn't beat you guys up too much. Uh, when you have time, explain the difference between zakat and the other. So zakat is just basic. Zakat is uh, money that has to be paid. You have to give it. It's it's it's. It, I think the Prophet Sam explained it as like imagine uh, the sea, and you know that scum that forms on top of the sea. That's zakat. It's it, it, zakat is money that doesn't belong to you. This, this, uh, yeah, no, alhamdulillah, rose with thorns. Don't, don't work. I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna make people feel guilty or anything like that. Um, so, um, it's like, it's the, it's the, it's the part of your wealth that doesn't belong to you. You have, you have, you go, it's, you're obligated to, uh, give it. And you could choose where to give it. You could choose to give it to, to the poor and needy if you so wish. Give it to the Beit al Zakat. That, you know, that, that you can give it to Da'is, those who are calling to the people to Islam. You you can you give it to new Muslims. So for example, our brother Carter, um, his his cause that we did we raised for him, um, you know he, he was entitled to be a recipient of zakat because he was a position where he was uh, had nowhere to live, and uh, he's a new Muslim, and thus he could be a recipient of zakat. So there are different categories. People can choose. You don't have to give it to a masjid. You can give it to the you can give it to whom you like, but you have to give it if you're in a, in the category of excess wealth yeah and so and so it's 2.5 percent of your excess wealth so imagine if you're a millionaire or a billionaire you got you got zakat to pay yeah and wherever you give it to so in the arab countries i think in qatar kuwait and all these they have a place called beta zakat and so all the um all the people give their zakat to the Beit al-Zakat and then the Beit al-Zakat will distribute it as to where it feels it needs to go. And people can um, request and such at the Beit al-Zakat. So it's, it's done officially, obviously, in a Muslim country. But in a non-Muslim country, it's a different story. Yeah, and, and sadaqa is, is money that you don't have to. It's your money. You've earned it, you do what you like with it, but you decide that that money, rather than spend it on yourself, 
you'd rather give it to, to uh, help somebody or help something. And at the same time with sadaqah, because it's voluntarily, the reward is subhanallah. Because you don't have to do this. You're not obligated to give this money away. This is your money and it's your right to keep it. But you choose to think, you know what? I'm going to try and benefit somebody. And the beautiful thing in Islam, that whenever you give something for the cause of Allah, for the sake of Allah, for no other reason because it's for Allah or for a Muslim or such, Allah says what? It's a beautiful loan. It's a beautiful loan. So Allah says when you give, you're not giving. You're, you're lending to Allah. You're lending the money to Allah. And on the day of judgment, um, you'll be repaid. So it's not something you're going to lose. So it's like an investment, if you like. So when you when you pay your sadaqah, when you give sadaqah, it's investment. There is a return coming. But that return is not in this world. It's in the hereafter. At the same time, don't get me wrong, as anyone who gives charity, there is a reward in this life because you, you want to see that thing you're donating to succeed or you want to see that person you've given to benefit. So if you're benefit to somebody who's poor and you see them that, you know, they manage to eat and sort themselves out or someone who's homeless and you help help them with that <coughs> or, or a masjid and you and you see it grow and become um, a, a benefit for the ummah, then your reward is there. But what does Allah say? Allah says, when you give in the cause of Allah, it's nothing more than a beautiful loan. And what's a loan? It means you're going to get it back. But in the hereafter, you're not going to get money back. Yeah, in the hereafter, you're going to get a different reward. It's going to be something else, inshallah. And this is why, mashallah, it, and, and especially the time. Look at the time you're being asked to give sadaqah, to give charity to a masjid that's being built brand new, which is going to be a dawah center catering for all of the community, men, women, and children. Yeah, and you're being asked to donate to this in the month of Ramadan, in the last 10 days of Ramadan. What an opportunity, subhanAllah. Because this wudu area will get completed and then there'll be no opportunity to be um, to invest. Or who knows whether you'll see another Ramadan. Who, never, who knows whether this Ramadan is your last Ramadan. Who knows? And this is your opportunity. And the, we know the rewards in Ramadan is increased multitude times. So th this is the opportunity for you. We, uh, Amberine saying we've reached the target. Okay, my, my, my thing is saying it hasn't reached it yet. Oh, there we go. Oh, mashallah. See, that's what I want to see. I want to see some inspiration. So we smashed through the target. So we're on 1575. But I feel I need to do a stream of this. I need to have a video playing from the masjid. I need to keep showing you. And, you know, you know one of those, like, kind of uh, um, a welfare trust type flexes. Uh, all right. I'm not, I'm not going to get, like, a celebrity with me and get people phoning in and stuff. But... I think I need to do a stream with this because um, we, we raised 15 grand last year, mashallah. Um, what's Mehdi said? There's a unit. <laughs> there's a Unitarian church who hates social more as much as you do. He also debunks Trinitarians day and night. You need to talk, have a talk one day, inshallah. Uh, we have Waqif, which is a trust that produce. Yes, exactly. I think a Waqif in, um, if I'm not wrong, in uh, in Mecca is the uh, clock tower. If I'm not wrong, I'm pretty sure that clock tower in uh, Mecca, uh, the rent, the, the income from it goes towards um, supporting Muslims or, or goes to some kind of charity. If I'm not wrong, I, I'm pretty sure the one one of those. One of those hotels next to the Kaaba is uh, the income goes towards um, or the profit or something goes towards the uh, some kind of charity, if I'm not wrong. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure John Fontaine was telling me about this. Who was it John who told me about this? As Amberine says, please don't forget the last, the, these last 10 nights of Ramadan. Don't forget our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Give hope to the people of Gaza with your sadaqahs. And there's a link there. I don't know what that link is. Where's that link? 
Oh, and Lebanon this year. MashaAllah. Well, these links must be coming from other streams, I'm assuming. Jazakallah khair, my man. Really appreciated it. Thank you. All right, we'll have just one refresh and then we're going to go. MashaAllah, we're on 15.75. So we hit the target. Yeah, no, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Just uh, which charity? That's all. All right. Um... Muslim countries just increasing, never decreasing for charity. Alhamdulillah. What? Muslim countries increasing, never decreasing for charity. Why sad face? Don't know what that means. All right. I'm going to go. I shall see you uh, tomorrow morning, inshallah. I'll try not to be late tomorrow. Um, and we should hopefully finish the book um, until tomorrow. Thank you uh, for my uh, mods today, Amberine and uh, MA and Laith for pretty sure he's up to something else because he oh there he is there he is mashallah yay laith is still about mashallah alhamdulillah and laith and thank you for uh jumping on laith and explaining how you do dawa in daisy always a sad face with that one is it okay <laughs> i think i can i can work out why the sad face all right um i shall see you tomorrow morning assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu let's have one last refresh do we get any more in Nah, 1575. Alhamdulillah. Okay, here comes the lion.